Hi guys, welcome back to another video. I hope you're all doing really well. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you for the support since the release of my DIY CNC a few months back. We've had loads of people come and join the Discord and there's a lot of activity around this on my website. So I'm really, really pleased that so many of you are interested and are finding it useful. Just to let you know, I just released version 1.1 last week, so be sure to go check that out. Today we'll be cutting aluminium on my machine here. Now the parts that I'm going to be cutting are replacement parts for the machine. So they'll be replacing the handmade parts that I created for the Y-axis. These parts will be the Y-axis motor mounting brackets and also the Y-axis ball screw bearing block brackets as well. This will allow my y-axis to run a lot smoother and I'll be able to install rigid real couplers on there with no play whatsoever which should hopefully, hopefully lead to a bit more accuracy as well. Before we get started I just wanted to go over some things that I think are key to know before you dive in and try to machine aluminium. Make no mistake about it, I'm definitely no expert in metal machining. I'd consider myself an absolute beginner. So. If you have any additional advice, if you are more experienced in this, then please share it in the comments below. I'm always looking to learn and absorb new information. What I am gonna do though, is share my experience so far using my machine. Now, this might not be the best way to do it. I'm, you know, put my hands up here. I'm just trying and sharing. So I just wanna see what my machine can do and go from there so as you'd expect you know machining aluminium is very different to machining wood when working with metals we need to be more cautious with our bits and take into consideration that chip clearance and lubrication are crucial for optimal performance in this video I'll be using a handful of different drill bits but the main milling bits I'm going to be using are an eighth inch and a quarter inch carbide O flute end mill that's a single flute. Um, these are excellent bits for cutting aluminium because they, as I said, have a single flute, which is very effective at clearing metal chips, allowing for cleaner cuts. And something else to consider as well, depending on how strong your machine is, is that using a larger diameter bit will put more strain on the machine and require more torque to actually spin. So consider that and also that it generates more waste material too. So this can be problematic if you're having trouble clearing away the chips. So maybe less waste material will be better for your system. Or if you've got a really good extraction system, for example, you can take away as much material as you want. Let's also discuss speeds and feeds. While many of you are probably already very familiar with this concept, I'll cover it for those of you that are not. Generally with wood, you can get away with not knowing too much about feeds and speeds because wood is a lot softer than metal obviously and it's a bit kinder in that it's a bit more forgiving and you're less likely to break bits when working with metal if you make a mistake or you run too hot you're going to melt the material snap your bits in half it's you have to go in very very careful so Let's talk about surface speed, which is a unit of measurement that represents how quickly the cutting edge of a tool moves across the surface of the workpiece. It's basically a relationship between spindle speed in RPM and the diameter of the tool. And it's important not to confuse this with feed rate, which refers to the rate at which the tool advances through the material. They are two different concepts. Generally, there are surface speed recommendations for different materials but these can also vary based on the quality of your bits. For instance, carbide bits might allow you to work slightly faster than high-speed steel bits, and they'll likely have a longer lifespan as well. The use of coolant can affect this too. So this, this is a deep, deep rabbit hole you can dive into. Like I said, I'm no expert. I can't offer any concrete expert advice on this, but I think most people would agree. Generally, the goal for most machinists is to extend the lifespan of their bits where possible which is always about finding a balance between all these different variables so why is surface speed so important and how can we calculate it tools like fusion 360 often calculate this stuff for you but it's beneficial to understand it for yourself if the surface speed is too low it can lead to increased cutting forces resulting in a poor surface finish 
and more wear on your machine and bits. If the surface speed is too high, it can generate excessive heat, causing the material to melt, leading to tool wear and often tool breakage. Since I don't have coolant available on my machine here, I'll stick to the lower end of the recommendation for surface speed for aluminium. Given that we already know our target cutting speed, we can calculate our RPM to ensure that we remain a consistent surface speed. Now that we've determined our target RPM that we need in order to maintain our surface speed, we can calculate the feed rate. It's influenced by two main factors, chip load and the number of flutes on the tool. Chip load is basically the thickness of material removed by each cutting edge of the tool in a single revolution. A common chip load for aluminium is roughly 0.1 millimeters per tooth. Number of flutes obviously just refers to the number of cutting edges on the tool and you can easily work that out just by looking at the tool and counting them. The feed rate can then be calculated as well using the following formula. So we've got feed rate equals chip load in millimeters per tooth times the number of flutes times the RPM. And in this case here I've worked it out for my 8 inch bit. That's kind of a safe spot on the lower end for aluminium. Now what this essentially tells us is that the more flutes your bit has, the faster your feed rate can be. This is because a bit with one flute has to take out a larger bite of the material per revolution, whereas having two flutes essentially halves that. Now this doesn't mean you can just go and buy a four flute bit and crank your feed rate up. There are a lot of other factors to consider here, like is your machine even capable of doing that? How much heat will it generate? Is it going to melt the material and then gunk up your flutes? Do you have coolant? How well can you evacuate chips? You see there's, there's a lot of factors at play here. And this is why you can't just take somebody else's settings and apply them to your machine. You have to just start in the safe zone and slowly push your machine to see what it's capable of. Of course this doesn't happen overnight. It can take months or even years to truly understand your machine which is why I made it clear at the start here that this is my first time trying this. So when machining metals, it's crucial to clear chips away from the cutting area as quickly as possible. While vacuum extraction, like what's used for wood, is an option, metal chips are heavier and can be harder to pick up. A more effective method that is commonly used is just blasting air at the cutting area to blow the chips away. Most people use a compressor with a high pressure nozzle to do this, but I'm gonna take a slightly different approach, which is a very experimental one, and I honestly don't know how well it'll perform. I'm basically gonna to try to just use an air pump, specifically this Charles Austin ET120. It pumps 120 liters per minute at 0.15 bar, so it's not very high pressure, and it's typically used in applications like ponds and septic tanks, that kind of thing. We'll see how that goes and hopefully we can still get some relatively decent results with the setup that I've got. To facilitate the air pump approach, I needed to make a custom nozzle that could direct the airflow directly at the bit. The nozzle would need to allow the air to flow freely, causing no back pressure. So to experiment with this, I designed a 3D printable nozzle that hooks right onto the spindle motor, very similar to how my 3D printed dust boot does. I also printed brackets as well to help direct the tubing and there's also a bracket to secure a T-splitter on the back of the Z-axis which just holds all those tubing parts nicely. When machining metals you also need to be very prepared for the significant amount of mess that it creates. My setup here isn't really ideal for metal machining and I knew that when I designed it because metal machining isn't something that I'm going to be doing a lot of. I want to be able to do it when I'm doing robotics projects or I just need little parts or other things but primarily I'm working with wood. Oftentimes people put an enclosure around their machine. Um, most high-end machines are enclosed anyway to use coolant and stuff like that. So I think that's just worth factoring in here. What I've done is create a versatile setup that allows me to work with wood and occasionally cut metals without the need for specialized machines. Since cutting oil is also needed when machining metals, I don't want to soak it into the spoil board that I use for woodwork, so I've covered that over. So just be mindful of these factors when you plan to play around with metal materials. 
To test out the system, I performed some simple cuts on this expendable piece of stock material. After gaining some confidence, I moved on to milling out some new parts for my machine. Okay, so here we are in Fusion 360, and I wanted to quickly share the latest updates on my machine and show you the parts I'll be milling. The components I'll be working on are the Y-axis motor brackets, which we explained at the start, and these hold the motors, obviously, and the ball screw bearing blocks. As I mentioned throughout the build series, I originally built my machine by hand with basic tools, which naturally limits the level of accuracy I could achieve just due to human error. I'll be remilling these parts with CNC precision, which will allow for a much smoother Y-axis and enable me to install higher quality couplers. I have a 10mm thick piece of stock 6082T6 aluminium. This plate is around 400 by 250 millimeters and it cost around 60 quid here in the UK. I modeled the stock material in Fusion 360, laid out the parts and then created some tool paths. I kept it simple here, just using drilling to do most of the holes, 2D pockets to cut out the larger circles and 2D contours to cut out the shape of the parts. Because of the expense of the aluminium plate, it's often always a good idea to do a dry run on an expendable piece of MDF. It's so easy to make mistakes in cam and I'd rather find the mistakes on a cheap piece of MDF board than ruin my aluminium stock. The tool paths all ran as expected so I quickly moved on to the real deal. For work holding I used the trusty old method of tape and glue. It works really well with aluminium and it holds the parts in place without the use of tabs. I secured the plate in place and installed my center drill bit ready to mill out the start of these 4mm holes. An upgrade I added to the machine recently was the Z probe. It works really well with a Mach 3 breakout board and my Z axis heights are now perfect, saving me so much time. I centered the holes and then swapped the center drill bit out for a 4mm drill bit. I then drilled all the way through and I did the same for the 5mm holes which all turned out really nice. I then milled out the 8mm holes using the 8 inch end mill and you can see the effectiveness of the air blasting those chips away. I then swapped the 8 inch bit out for the quarter inch bit and milled out the much larger 35mm holes for the ball screw to pass through. Now because I'm using a larger bit here, if we go back to the formula from before, in order to maintain my desired surface speed for aluminium, I'd have to half the RPM. So basically with larger tools you can reduce the RPM but raise the feed rate to maintain the right chip load. This is why people who work with harder materials a lot tend to go for high torque, low speed spindle motors. As your RPM drops, the motor will require more torque and use more power trying to cut through the material. Using the quarter inch bit, all my cuts were done at a 0.5mm step down. The machine handled this very easily and I'm sure it's capable of much more. The result was impressive with a nice finish. I didn't machine any chamfers onto this because I was going to have to thread some of these holes anyway so I figured I'd just do that by hand. But I will be trying out some of that in the near future. I then sanded them down, buffed them up and installed them onto my machine. Immediately there was a noticeable difference in how much smoother my Y-axis motors were running. I was also able to install these high quality couples and there's no play or wobble in them whatsoever. I'll probably do something similar on a few more parts as well, maybe the Z-axis motor plate and the spindle motor plate as well. It's not really a necessity, like I said, the machine is completely functional if you build it by hand. There's just always going to be a degree of human error when you use hand tools. So I could see that difference immediately when I put the new parts in. But it makes sense, right? You know, if I've got the capability now to improve the accuracy of my machine by machining new upgrades, then why not? I'd be silly not to do that. Also, as a means of practicing, I'd rather try to practice and create something meaningful than just cutting aluminium for the fun of it and then having to throw it away or recycle it afterwards. So there we have it, my first aluminium parts cut on a machine that I designed and built with hand tools right here in the workshop. 
it's kind of cool to have a machine that is manufacturing upgrades and improved parts for itself. I'm sure it's capable of a lot more and I'll be exploring that over the next several months as I work on a variety of new projects. I'll be sure to share all of that with you as well so make sure you're subscribed. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope it was informative. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.